be with you this morning. Uh, I wonder if you spend much of your time feeling tired. Uh, And I don't mean you didn't get enough sleep last night, you should have put the phone down earlier and gone to bed a bit sooner. Uh, I just mean exhausted, worn out because the world that we're in and life in general is just relentless, just keeps coming at us, just uh, keeps throwing up problems and challenges. Now, do you ever feel tired, worn out from that? Uh, I certainly do at times. And when we do that, how do we navigate the world that's like that? Where, where do we look to, to get a bit of rest, a bit of respite? Uh, you know, ask yourself when you're confronted by all the stuff of life, uh, challenges that life throws up, problems that you look forward to and you think that could turn my life or my loved one's lives upside down in a moment. Um, maybe the way politics is discussed. You know, We're going to get a, a good look at that with the American election this week, aren't we? You know, the way we speak past each other and just it's never productive. Or maybe we even think about the, the good times when life is mostly going pretty well and you'll still sit there in little health niggles or uh, unmet desires, all the rest of it. When all that stuff is going on, where do you look to find a bit of respite from the world that we're in? Uh, I'm sure there's lots of reasons, uh, sorry, lots of answers, lots of places people look. Uh, for some of us, maybe it's work, you know, work hard, build up a bit of a nest egg, uh, and then if I get to the point where I have enough money that I know where my next meal's coming from, I can keep the lights on, then happy days, I'll be able to stop and just rest then. Uh, maybe for others, it's things like our relationships. Uh, you know, find the right person, life will still be tough, but at least I'll, you know, we can bear uh, each other up and, and get through this together, it'll be a whole lot easier. Uh, maybe you look for meaning in activities, whether your paid work or your hobbies and your enjoyment. And we just think, you know, if I can do something that feels like either a bit of escapism or a contribution, then again, uh, life will, will be happy. I can finally get some respite from, from all the other rubbish. Or maybe it's even just the spiritual experiences that some of us want. Yeah? Come to a place like this, get surrounded by nice architecture and a bit of ritual, meaningful ritual. It's like the the spiritual shot in the arm so that we can get out, you know, a moment of escapism, get back out there and we'll be okay. Uh, lots of places, aren't there, that we look for rest when the world keeps coming at us and exhausting us. One of the truly great books in English literature is The Pilgrim's Progress, which some of you will have read, I'm sure. It's an allegory of the Christian life and the main character, a bloke by the name of Christian, unimaginatively named Christian, uh, He finds himself at the beginning of the book with a burden on his back and he's weighed down by it and it nearly ends him at various points. And maybe when we consider life, that's how we feel. And maybe when we try to escape that stuff or find some place of rest or help, uh, we just feel like nothing can remove that burden. It's still there. Well, if that's how we're feeling, or if that's how people out there are feeling that we might be talking to, What we want to hear is Jesus' great invitation, don't we? Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. I'm gentle, lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's a wonderfully beautiful invitation, isn't it? And it's one that I know is is dear to many people uh, because they've often told me that that it is. I want to spend a bit of time dwelling on what Jesus is promising us this morning so that hopefully we can find that rest that he's holding out. So there's two main halves to what I want to say. And the first is to recognize that as Jesus makes this invitation, uh, he's calling us to know him personally. right? And why that's significant? I think if I talk to a lot of the people that I come across, if you're, if you're talking to them, Uh, Christianity is basically a moral code in the eyes of many. What I mean by that is if you ask them, you know, are you right with God? Are you acceptable to God? The answer will be, I think so. I think I'm good enough. I think I do enough that God will accept me. Uh, It's it's about doing, being, being a good person, improving, right? Which on one level is just the most logical thing to imagine. Because it's how we get ahead in life. You know, you work hard at your job, you'll get the promotion. Work hard at your marriage, it'll flourish. Uh, Work hard at building up a new skill, you'll attain it and be able to go out there and do all sorts of cool things. And if I just work hard enough at God, he's bound to accept me, right? 
I'll be, I'll be in his good books. And yet Jesus never says anything like that. His invitation is not come and figure things out. It's, it's come to me, he says. Come to him personally. And we've got to realise the context in which he's saying this is people who are coming at him for sure and they're after him for everything except for who he is. Uh, so we read those denunciations in Matthew chapter 11, right before Jesus makes this beautiful invitation. And in that context, he's just been wandering around with some of John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, showing them the miracles. Obviously, there's big crowds flocking to him to get healed or to be fed or whatever else is going on. And they're coming to him and yet they've, John's in jail and they're questioning, could this guy really have been the real deal? Because it doesn't seem to have worked out for him. And then Jesus starts saying, well, look, I've done these miracles, but woe to you people who've seen it and yet not repented. You know, they've, they've seen the glorious big things he's done, but not bothered to listen to the message that John had proclaimed and that now Christ is proclaiming. And so he's saying, you know, woe, woe to you. You should have repented. You should have turned to me. But instead of laboring and just wanting the quick fix of the miracle and the rest, he says, come to me. Come and find that rest that you want in me. And then as if to, I guess, hammer the point home, uh, suddenly you find if you get to chapter 12, opens with Jesus being reprimanded by the Pharisees. Why? Because on the Sabbath day, uh, the day of rest, he's wandering through a grain field, picking some grain for him and his disciples to eat. Now, you'd hardly say he was neglecting the stuff of God in order to you know, keep up with his worldly concerns. Uh, he was simply relaxing, having a bite to eat, and maybe ironically, you've got the Pharisees at this point taking the day of rest that was given, gifted to people and turning it itself into a work, you know. Make sure you've done everything before sundown Friday because if you so much as pick a grain of corn on Saturday, you're in trouble, right? People labouring, striving through their efforts to try and please God and yet in the middle of all of that, Jesus says, no, no, just, just come to me, I'll lift the burdens, I'll give you rest. It's a much more wonderful invitation. Now, what you'll notice Jesus never says in that is come and master a moral code. Come and become a, you know, a doctor in some great moral philosophy. Come and champion an ideal like love or, or charity or whatever else. No, he simply says, come, come and know me. Come and experience what I will do for you. And we can see indeed in the Gospels, all kinds of people take up that invitation to come to him in some sense, don't they? Uh, everyone from the very well-to-do, uh, very together people like the Pharisees who are educated and who are morally upright through to people who are just broken by sickness and illness uh, through to others who are deeply entangled in sin. All kinds of people come at Jesus. And so when he says, come to me all you, you know, it really is the open invitation. But so often what we see is it's the people who imagine that they're self-sufficient who are sent away empty and those who come empty who are sent away full. And so the rich young ruler who comes saying, how must I, you know, how, what must I do to inherit life is told, well, on the one point where he has it wrong, he goes away empty, he goes away despondent because despite keeping all the commands, he can't let go of the wealth. It keeps him from God. That's the thing he's trusting in. And yet, on the other hand, you have someone like the woman in John 4. A woman, a Samaritan, no worldly standing, deeply in sin. Everything is against her on one level. And yet, despite the fact that Jesus not only meets her, but lays out before her all of her sin, she know, he knows everything. She is the one that, left, that leaves forgiven and changed by that experience. Uh, it's, it's not the way we think. It should have been the other way around in those two stories. And yet the invitation is for all of us to recognize that we come to him in weakness, in need, and to have the rest that he offers. But weakness is key. I had one fellow put it this way this week, that Jesus is a little bit like a soup kitchen. You imagine the soup kitchen will feed anyone who will walk through the doors and ask for help, who will acknowledge it. 
The problem isn't that they're not generous. The problem is that so often in our pride, we don't think we need their help. So people won't walk through the door. And we we come to Jesus thinking that uh, we don't particularly need his help. That's when we're sent away empty. It's not that he lacks generosity. It's that we need to approach him on his terms. And so if we approach him on his terms, the promise is for rest. So how do we understand this idea of rest? Well, the key idea, as we talked about with the kids' spot, is Jesus talking about his yoke. Uh, The big wooden beam put on the working animal that was designed to lead them so that the owner could direct them where they wanted to go, where they needed to go. And this is what Jesus is picking up on this imagery here. And he says, you know, There's a sense in which all of us are really under a yoke of something or someone. All of us, whether we realise it or not. Uh, All of us are serving a master, maybe God, maybe something else. Uh, How do we figure out what we're serving? Well, where do we spend our time, our energy, our resources? There's a good question. Uh, Because, for instance, if the whole world stops for your job and no other demand can get a look in, well, then guess what your master is? Or if the the extracurricular activity or the hobby, if everything grinds to a halt so that you can indulge in that and all the rest can go and come play second place, well, again, you've got your answer, right? Or if your relationships and making people happy means that you you govern all your actions based on how I can impress this person and then that person and that that, or whatever. Again, we we know where our allegiances are lying at that point. Uh, We might ask, you know, where's our yoke? Well, the best place to look, probably your bank statement and your diary, right? Where do your time, where do your resources go? What demands are you following? Now, that's an important question for us to ask ourselves because Scripture actually puts a pretty stark contrast in front of us because if we willingly submit to masters that are not Christ, we hear words like those in Lamentations 1.14, which if you... Don't know the book of Lamentations. It's a desperate book. People of God are under siege right before the exile. uh, And it's this moment of just lament, hence the word Lamentations. And the writer says this. He says, My sins have been bound into a yoke. By his hands they were woven together. They have been hung on my neck, and the Lord has sapped my strength. And you think there's a yoke that's the opposite of what Jesus had offered. Jesus says, Come and I'll give you rest. But this yoke of sin hangs heavy and saps us, exhausts us. And whether we recognise it or not, actually the fundamental problem all of us have in life is that the world is cursed by sin. Our exhaustion comes back to that. We often push God away, follow the own desires of our own hearts to where we would want to go and ignore his commands. If you like, we sell ourselves into slavery of sin. We wear a certain type of yoke when we do that. Christ offers a better yoke, doesn't he? Isn't that what we read? Come to me all who labour and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle, humble of heart. You'll find rest for your souls. You think Jesus, he's he's won that for us. I mean, picture yourself on that that Good Friday, first Good Friday, some 2,000 years ago. Jesus has a yoke of sorts put on him, doesn't he? A big wooden crossbeam, the instrument of his execution as he's led to the place where he will be crucified. And he went there as, you know, judged as a criminal, but no no sin of his own, no reason for him to go there. What hung around him was actually our sin. Uh, That's what hung heavy upon him. And as he bled and died, he did that, not because he had served the wrong masters, but because we had. He died in our place. And because he's done that, because he's taken that yoke of sin that Lamentations would say each one of us would wear by nature, because he's done away with that in his death, he actually offers that now we can have his yoke upon us, uh, his yoke of forgiveness, of a renewed life, of acceptance before God. And he tells us there's nothing we need to do other than simply come to him. Come to me, he says. That's it. Now, I think coming to him means a couple of things we need to keep in mind. I think, first of all, it means coming not imagining we are self-sufficient. 
Uh, that's a problem that we can have. Not imagining that in a world that is just exhausting and relentless, we have the tools and the resources within ourselves to navigate that. Uh, because again, in the gospel, everyone who came to him proudly thinking they had something to offer, they're the ones that are sent away empty, inevitably. Whereas everyone who came with no case to plead, no merit, no nothing to put before Jesus, well, they still, when they came, they were still forgiven and accepted. And so if we want to know what Jesus is saying, the first thing to do is stop pretending we have any su- sufficiency in ourselves when it comes to God. We need to empty ourselves of any pretense of that. So that's the first thing. But that may be on another extreme. Uh, sometimes I think we can minimise the reality of our burdens, which is another mistake. What I mean by that is too often there are sins that we hold on to, uh, things that are in our life that God says need to go, but we, te- you know, the Scripture says they're not, they're not fitting for God's people, but we want to hold on to them for whatever reason. Now, I'm not saying that we need to get rid of those burdens before we can come to Jesus. Hopefully you hear that I'm saying the opposite. Uh, that we come with those burdens and he's the only one who can lift them. We come to him to have them lifted. But at the same time, we're also saying, uh, coming to him is not to say, here's 99% of my life, take those burdens, but just let me hold on to these couple. As if the ox could somehow go in that way in every part of his body except for the horn that goes off that way. There's a sense in which we are, either Jesus lifts all our burdens or none of them. He is leading us wholeheartedly or he's not at all. We need to be very clear on that. And so we recognise that we come to him needing help in everything. We come wholeheartedly. Now in the book, uh, in the Pilgrim's Progress, what I talked about earlier, uh, as I said, it begins with Christian crushed by this big burden. And as he, as he goes through the early couple of chapters of that book, He's weighed down by it. He's nearly killed by it at times. But he comes to a point where Jesus takes it from him. I want to read to you uh, the wonderful little paragraph in which that happens because it certainly says it better than I could, uh, describes what's going on. So this is, this is from the Pilgrim's Progress. We read, Now I saw in my dream that the highway up which Christian was to go was fenced on either side with a wall, and that wall was called Salvation. Up this way, therefore, did burdened Christian run, but not without great difficulty because of the load on his back. He ran thus till he came at a place somewhat ascending, and upon that place stood a cross, and a little below, in the bottom, a sepulchre. So I saw in my dream that just as Christian had come up to the cross, his burden was loosed from his shoulders and fell from his back and began to tumble and so continued to do till it came to the mouth of the sepulchre, where it fell in, and I saw it no more. Then Christian, glad and lightsome, said with a merry heart, He hath given me rest in his sorrow, and life by his death. Then he stood a while to look and wonder, for it was very surprising to him that the sight of the cross should thus ease him of his burden. He looked, therefore, and looked again, even till the springs that were in his head sent forth waters down his cheeks. Now, apart from the, uh, the beautiful prose in which he writes, uh, what a lovely picture of salvation. We come to Christ. We feel burdened by the world. Look to Jesus. Look, and as the psalmist says, come and taste that the Lord is good. Come and experience his goodness. Come and submit to him whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light.